a very, very warm welcome uh, to you all. And thank you very much indeed for uh, the calling into our, our webinar this morning. Um, the, we're going to talk about the autumn statement uh, occurring yesterday. Um, please feel free to post your questions in the question box. Uh, we will have a session at the end uh, to cover all your questions. But if your question isn't got to, uh, please don't worry. We will try and uh, we will have a record of all those questions and we'll try and come back to you um, separately on that. So the autumn statement, um, something of a something of a surprise in many ways, um, given the fact that we had our, our, our mini budget from the previous prime minister and the previous um, chancellor of the Exchequer, um, just in September 22, just 23rd of September, um, less than two months ago. Um, so with that in mind and with the with with all the political changes, there is a distinct political flavour um, to this budget. Um, and one which uh, is, is probably unsurprising and, and I don't think will be a massive surprise for anybody on this call. Um, there is certainly worth remembering that there are various audiences uh, for, for the budget statement from the, from the Chancellor, um, not least uh, the, the backbenchers um, with, a, with a view to trying to unite uh, the party a little bit more, uh, given the problems they had um, just, just a couple of months ago. Um, but there is also uh, a distinct flavour of playing to the um, playing to the voting public, because uh, we will have a general election at the very latest by January 25, so probably going to take place in 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 2024. Um, we did notice there was a there was a distinct lack of supply side reforms, so maybe those are being held back um, to be able to uh, roll them out a little bit later. Um, but that will be very very interesting to watch. But it was also interesting to see that he'd gone for um freezes of of uh, of 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 bans rather than rather than actual tax rises which always seems to play a little bit better with the general public even though it raises um similar amounts of money um so as well as that of course um is the market so during the uh, mini budget that was only two months ago um, the markets went into uh, a bit of a panic and things didn't go too well and most of those um reforms had to be reversed so there's a big big flavor through this budget of trying to uh impress upon the market um that uh and, and the uh, and, and the city that actually we're under control now everything is going to be good um and you know we're going to be we're, we're going to tighten our belts and, and and be fiscally more responsible um including two new fiscal rules um but at the same time we've also got um Quite a quite a gloomy global picture um, with the with the tragic war in Ukraine, a driving uh, among other things driving um, the, the the cost of energy up um, and causing causing a large amount of inflation as well. Um, depending on the political outlook as to how much that's to blame uh, for the current gloomy uh, outlook. So, um, if we can move to the next slide, please. Fantastic. Um, well, I say fantastic. It's not good reading, um, I'm afraid. Um, government borrowing now is at an all-time high. Um, that's a total government borrowing at a all-time high. Obviously, it's slightly higher in the pandemic, but over overall, borrowing is, is at an all-time high. With a total national debt of 96.6% of GDP, um, that's expected to rise further um, through to next year, I, I believe, over 97%. Um, and that comes from the figures uh, that were released just in August this year. So um, already, already rising above that. Um, inflation still rising. Um, I know two days ago it's gone above 11% now, um, which is um, causing uh, an enormous amount of, of, of problems within, within the economy. Um, and in fact, the Chancellor of the Exchequer actually motioned that, um, that this, was, this was the enemy, uh, that, that inflation is the enemy. Um, and that is the political spin that he put on that. Um, I've got growth flat and negative. Actually, we are actually in recession now. Um, and the Chancellor acknowledged that. Um, and business investment is down. Um, against that background, um, we have a we have a, a potential black hole uh, in the public finances. Uh, some have estimated to be over 50 billion pounds. Um, and that obviously necessitates a certain amount of tax rises. Um, tax rises are never going to be massively uh, easy within a refresh recessionary environment because obviously you 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 have tax take falling as the economy falls 
um, rather than rising as, as, as with, with growth. Um, so not a great picture, I'm afraid, and I'm afraid the next few slides are going to pretty much say the same thing. So if we go to the next slide um, and we can look at the growth forecasts, um, growth forecasts looking looking pretty 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 sorry. Um, still not getting back above uh, the pre-pandemic trend, um, although uh, both the Eurozone and um, the US are now above pre-pandemic levels, although they're, they're beyond, be, be, they're both behind the trend. Um, UK looking a little bit behind that. Um, how much of that has to do with the current economy and how much of that has to do with Brexit is, um, is, is up for debate and probably will be part of the debate going forward. Um, politically over the next ne next few in the next few years. So if we flick on to the next slide, uh, which talks about inflation, obviously inflation is the enemy, um, as the Chancellor said, and actually we're well above 11% now, um, and that may go higher before it comes down. If we're looking for a ray of sunshine within the, the gloomy economic outlook, I guess the ray of sunshine is going to come from this Bank of England monetary policy report, which was only released in November this year, um, which is forecasting that inflation is going to fall quite rapidly um, through uh, 23 and into through 24, um, getting down before the end of 24, down below the 2%. Um, my own view, and I think that the view of BDO is that's a little optimistic, um, but certainly we would be expecting to see um, inflation falling soon, and certainly hoping that inflation is going to fall soon. So if we flick on to um, the last of my slides here, um, basically we have a we have a, an autumn statement which is all about restor restoring stability to UK government finances. This is their number one priority calm the markets down, get everything back onto an even keel. Um, you'll see that uh, the OBR um, has made its uh, re-emergence rather than being ignored as it was under the uh, in the mini budget um, to give just to give that kind of credibility to the fiscal statements being made. And the, 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 the flavor of that is very much um, around stability and, uh, and, 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 and control of, of government spending. Um, so we have freezes and below inflation growth in government spending, um, although uh, uh, marked uplift in, in health and education, although that may be uh, eaten up by uh, eaten up by the uh, by by the inflationary rates. Um, we have some tax raises now, and obviously with fiscal drag, um, we're going to have some more tax rises going forward. Um, some marked life support spending, uh, which is which is going to be very very welcome um, from people who in, in those kind of environments, um, a rise to the to the minimum wage, um, and uh, support for um, for energy costs going forward to April, obviously uh, through the winter anyway, uh, but then dropping off quite steeply after that. Um, growth plans seem to be very limited, um, as I say surprised in some ways not to see some more supply side reforms um, but as I say I think maybe they may be held back for a, a future a future position. So let's leave the economic forecast for a starter it's I don't want to depress everybody on the call um, and let's hand over to Liam and Liam could talk to us about the business taxes a part of that budget. Thank you Liam. Thank you Glenn and good morning everybody. Um, today uh, I'm going to talk about sort of uh, the changes in the statement uh, relating to corporation tax uh, and, and a little bit uh, on business rates as well. Uh, if we could move on to the, the first slide, uh, which probably doesn't surprise anybody, um, it sort of deals with the rate changes and the rate changes were by far and away the biggest way that's been that, that the Chancellor has used to sort of raise revenue uh, in, in this autumn statement. Um, now, Many of the numbers on this slide won't be a surprise to anybody because a lot of them were were flagged uh, ahead of the statement yesterday. Obviously, the uh, the headline is that the sort of the main rate of corporation tax move into uh, twenty five percent as of April twenty twenty three, and of course that was something that uh, Rishi, when he was uh, Chancellor, had had actually introduced himself and had been unwound in the September statement. Um, and in and around the the twenty five percent tax rate, there's a there's an apparatus of 
uh, uh, re related sort of provisions and and all of those are going to work much in the same way as as was announced by rishi originally so there'll be a 19 percent tax rate for small companies uh, there'll be a tapered rate between for, for profits between 50 and 250k uh, that, that basically join up those two rates um, and there will be uh, a 25 percent tax rate for uh, small companies that happen to be uh, close investment holding companies. Um, likewise, there is an increase in the diverted profits tax rate from 25 to, to 31. Diverted profits is, is, is almost an enhanced tax rate for, for arrangements that, that are kind of perceived to be tax avoidance, uh, diverting profits outside the UK. Um, one of the announcements that was made yesterday was that the bank surcharge is going down from 8% to 3%. Um, people in the banking community will be quick to point out, however, that as of April 2023, effectively that represents a 1% uh, tax increase when combined with the 25% the uh, uh, tax rate sort of uh, applied to corporate tax. Um, but I think the, the biggest news in this space, certainly over the last couple of weeks, has been uh, the introduction of what will be described, I think, in, in generally as a windfall taxes. And, and there are two parts to this. Um, the um, energy profits levy on oil and uh, gas was announced first. It had been originally believed that that would be a 25% tax rate. It was announced yesterday that the rate would, in fact, be 35%. And also... Um, with uh, over the next the last couple of days, it's been announced that there, in addition to that, there will be an electricity generator levy. And it was confirmed yesterday, the rate for that sort of levy would be 45%. Um, and both those levies will run through to uh, March uh, 2028. Um, and I think that it, it was suggested yesterday that, that together in their first year, they would raise a total of eight billion pounds, which is obviously quite a, a, a sizable sort of uh, new tax that um, which uh, uh, certainly a, a bit of an about turn for where we were sort of a, a month or so ago. Um, if we could go on to the next slide. One of the other areas where there was significant change uh, yesterday was R&D tax credits. Um, and for those of you who listened to the speech yesterday, could be forgiven for sort of missing that there was anything, any significant change in this area. Um, it had been believed that there would need to be some changes just to effectively, uh, with the increase to 25% tax rate, just to effectively uh, ensure that, 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 that there weren't enhanced reliefs just merely because of that tax rate increase. But that's not quite what's happened. Um, Many of you will be aware that there are effectively two R&D regimes, one for small and medium sized companies and one for large companies, which is referred to as RDEC. Um, and and the, the regime for small and medium sized companies, effectively the, the, the benefit of R&D uh, has actually been cut. Um, so for a small and medium sized company that basically had a hundred pounds of R&D, the, 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 the total benefit to them of that will will uh, effectively uh, go down to 21.5%. Um, um, conversely, for RDEC, for large companies, um, the, benefit, the benefit to them uh, of £100 worth of R&D expenditure will go up from 10.5% to around 15%. The other significant change for the, the, the small SME uh, companies is where they're loss-making, they have the entitlement to... Um, to, to, to get a, a cash credit as opposed to sort of just offsetting it against profits. And um, there has also been a sort of a, a change to the calculation of that cash credit. Um, so what that means in short is uh, if there's a hundred pounds of sort of R&D qualifying expenditure, the cash credit would be about 18.6% um, as opposed to previously, I think it was 33.35. So that's quite a significant drop. Um, in order to make that cash credit, they will effectively give up um, the ability to sort of carry forward losses of 100 and 186 on 100 pounds of R&D. So I think what that will mean is going forward, whereas I think in the past sort of uh, businesses have almost claimed that cash credit automatically. I think for businesses that might sort of uh, reverse back into profit in the near future, I think they'll probably have to think a little bit harder about whether they make that sort of cash credit claim uh, or, or not. Um, one final point on this slide, um, patent box relief. The, the effective rate of tax for uh, patent, uh, patent box relief is 10%. It had been felt that might change with the, the, 
the, the tax uh, rate increase to 25% or, or the mainstream and also sort of the pillar two initiative. Uh, but as it is, as it stands at the moment, that 10% uh, tax rate remains and, and that's quite a healthy differential between the 25% tax rate. So quite an advantage for those that fall within the patent box regime. If we could move to the next slide. Um, sticking with uh, R&D for, for one minute, there were some um, announcements that, that had been made sort of some time ago, which were effectively reconfirmed uh, in the statement yesterday. Um, there are some restrictions to what qualifies for R&D relief. Uh, that mainly relates to third party overseas workers. Um, so what that's trying to do is it's trying to reward sort of work done in the UK, but not outside the UK. And the relief was also expanded to include things like cloud computing, pure maths, data sets and the like, um, rewarding sort of almost clever things that are done within the UK. Um, there are also a number of administrative uh, changes to effectively enable enforcement uh, to, to be from HMRC's perspective. Um, I think the clear message on R&D came across, did come across in the speech is the government is very keen on R&D as a relief. They think it's very important to the economy. Um, those that qualify definitely should claim. Um, they are looking to tweak the relief. Um, uh, that they're looking to, to, to tweak that relief. So it's sort of uh, it, it, areas that benefit the economy uh, are, are, are structured in that way. The other point to, to note is um, it's really important that every business that makes an R&D claim has, has an R, is a ro makes a robust claim. Um, there's a particular focus on the, the SME space where it's believed that, that maybe sort of uh, abusive claims are being made and then actually that was subject of a House of Lords Select Committee debate this Monday. And I think the thought process is some of the some of those changes with sort of the um, to the SME regime and the RDEP regime, where the the value of the relief under each one of those is becoming close together, you perhaps that's perhaps driven by the thought process that the SME sort of regime has been abused. Also, that potentially the the uh, the RDEC regime potentially delivers more value to the UK economy in terms of sucking jobs into the UK. And there's a thought process in some of the paperwork around the budget that, that actually in the fullness of time, what you might end up with is, is one relief rather than the two systems. If we could sort of click onto the next page. Uh, sticking with reliefs, um, there wasn't much news on uh, capital allowances. Uh, effectively, everything that was announced yesterday was had pretty much been trailed before with the sort of the phasing out of the super deduction and special rate allowance. Uh, the clawbacks relating to those re two regimes went back to the position that, that we, we thought we had before the, uh, the step September mini statement confused things a little. Um, the, the one million pounds a year sort of uh, 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 upfront allowance expenditure has been made permanently. And the one bit of good news uh, or, or bit of new, new news yesterday was the first year allowances on electric car charging points was extended to 2025. If we could flip through to the next statement. The other area where there was quite significant changes was around business rates. Um, now, ahead of the statement, it, it, there was a fair bit of concern around business rates for, for two reasons. One, as of April 2023, um, a, a new business rate sort of method of valuing uh, sort of the, the properties was going to be introduced that, that it was believed would significantly sort of increase the number of companies' uh, rate, rateable sort of payments. The other thing combining with that is it had originally been sort of envisaged that the all the, the COVID reliefs would disappear as at sort of April 2023. Um, and there was a particular co concern for businesses, uh, you know, retail, uh, hospitality, leisure, that given the environment that we're currently operated in, they would be particularly uh, hit, hit particularly hardly by, hard by those changes. Um, the government's responded to that. They've introduced some focused reliefs around retail, hospitality and leisure sectors. Effectively, the, the pandemic reliefs will be extended, but not only extended, they'll be increased by 25%. There'll be also some more general reliefs that, that relate to the, the new valuation systems. Um, those will include some sort of freezing multipliers and percentage caps on increases. 
that that will sort of help sort of manage the transition to the to the new uh, rateable values. Uh, there was also an announcement of a decision not to introduce a new online sales tax, which had been muted. If we could move on to the next slide. A couple of uh, bits of detail which came out in and around the budget uh, or on and around the statement. The first one relates to uh, the global, uh, the minimum global corporate tax rate, um, which relates to the OECD uh, pillar two sort of legislation or the UK version of it. Um, now it was announced that this would take effect from 1st of Jan 2024, which I think is a year earlier than we were expecting. Uh, so that's relevant to any multinational organisation with worldwide uh, turnover over two, uh, over 750 million uh, euros. Um, there was a, uh, an announcement of a consultation in the creative sector uh, to, to simplify and modernise that arena, and I'm sure we'll hear more about that, more to come on that. Um, <clears throat> there was also an announcement um, that, that uh, uh, 79 million of funding over five years would go to HMRC to tackle serious fraud, which again is a, is a sort of a, I think it follows on from the pandemic and, and that basically there's a perception that sort of uh, that that there are areas that are being abused out there and those that are that there is an investment in sort of tackling that and punishing those individuals or co corporates pretty harshly uh, if we could move on to the final slide um, for those of you that followed the September mini budget you might be looking out sort of for what's happened to the leveling up agenda and the the concept of investment zones that were that were mentioned uh, as, as part of that mini budget. Um, there was absolutely no mention of, of investment zones at all in the uh, chan Chancellor's uh, statement. Uh, there was, a, though, an official paper released yesterday or, or the day before, which suggested that there would be a, a refocus of the programme. Um, and it suggested the, the programme would be uh, now used as a catalyst uh, for a number of the, um, sorry, I'll just, uh, I can't actually see those words because of the way that my screen's appearing. Um, but the, the suggestion was the, the first of those clusters will be announced in the coming months. I think what that does suggest uh, is that the current government are very much distancing themselves from the investment zone programme that was uh, announced as part of the, uh, the September mini uh, budget programme. Um, uh, and I, I would expect that as and when we do find out a little bit more about the refocus program, that it, it will look and feel quite different. Um, so that's a, a quick summary of what sort of was in the budget from a, a business sort of taxes, taxes perspective. I'll uh, hand, over, hand over now to uh, Caroline and employment taxes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Liam. Um, next slide, please. I'm, I'm going to start by talking about IR35. I know there's already been a question asked about this, um, probably because it was one of the most significant U-turns in the world of employment tax in the last 20 years. I scratched my head and tried to think of another, which was probably um, the uh, reintroduction of significant CSOP allowances, which happened in, uh, in the 1990s, late 1990s. So um, really important changes. My colleagues were trying to make me lose sleep by saying it would probably change again significantly yesterday. But um, I suppose some good news is that the IR35 um, reforms are as they were um, from the last period. So, so there is no specific change. Um, we're talking about off payroll labour in the private sector. Um, the engager remains responsible for operating PAYE and national insurance if the nature of the relationship with their workers is one of employment rather than self-employment. So one of the things to remember is that until now we've had a light touch so the revenue have been focusing more on helping people to get it right as opposed to looking to impose penalties. That has now expired. So what you need to do is you need to look at risks um, where your workers are engaged through personal service companies. So that's a company where they have a significant shareholding, often together with a spouse or a partner. Um, you need to look at partnerships. You need to look at the, the self-employed. They're treated as they always have been. 
um, consider issues relating to agency workers and other supply chain issues around um, managed service companies, a overseas agencies, and look very carefully at directors because a director is always subject to PAY and national insurance, no matter what they might think. They may have a separate engagement which causes them to be self-employed in a consultancy role, um, but that will be separate from the directorship, which will always be subject to PAY and national insurance. So it's important to think about how you are managing and tracking those risks and looking about whether you can prove that you are taking reasonable care to ensure that you are treating anybody who might be looked at as an employee for tax purposes as subject to PAY and national insurance. If you are not, there is a risk under the Criminal Finances Act that you are committing a corporate criminal offence which has an unlimited fine and you can be named and shamed. Um, and the defence from that is that you have taken reasonable care. So look at your policies and procedures and make sure that they support a sound um, evaluation of the employment status of all of your workers. It's really about your workforce risk management. Who are you paying? What are you paying them? And what are you paying them for? So I'm going to, to ask you just to turn to the next slide, please. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to talk now about national insurance. Um, we have seen in July an increase in the workers' national insurance threshold, which went up from £9,880 to £12,570. So it was aligned with the personal tax allowance, which added simplicity. This month, we've seen the reversal of the 1.25% national insurance increase, which came about because of the introduction of the health and social care levy. So this has done two things. Firstly, it's um, given an average £480 per annum saving for workers, which would be very welcome, particularly in the current economic circumstances. But it does mean that the calculations are really difficult. So um, it is worth checking that your payroll can cope with the ups and downs in the national insurance um, rates. So that, that's, that's quite complicated. Um, given those savings, it's absolutely no surprise at all that the NIC threshold for employees and employers alike have been frozen. Now, the serious issue here, and I'm not gonna go through all of these numbers, but the key point for you is they, they really don't change. So when you have a look at the numbers, they're staying the same. But what this represents is in real terms, it's going to be a cost increase for employers. So think very carefully about the amounts, amount of your spend on your employees. The employment allowance, which went up to £5,000 last year, has not changed. Government estimates are that that means that 40% of employers won't be paying any national insurance at all and won't be affected. But 60% will be. And that means that you need to manage your spend quite carefully. Next slide, please. Now, one of the interesting issues is we've seen very clearly that the lower thresholds for NIC, thereby increasing NIC take effectively, um, will be frozen until April 2028. The implication in the policy statement was that this also applied to the upper earnings limit. And that's a surprise because what it means is those on earnings above the threshold will be paying national insurance at just 2% on more of their salary as time goes by. Now, obviously we need to wait and see um, the bill when it comes out, the autumn, state, autumn statement bill. Um, that may change that. And it was slightly ambiguous in the wording in the policy statement. So keep your eyes open to see whether the upper earnings limit has indeed been frozen as was suggested or not. Next slide, please. So we've looked at the increase in cost for employers arising from NIC and the freezing of their of the limits for um, secondary contributions. The other increase in pay is gonna come around from min national minimum wage increases. And as you can see, the smallest increase is 9.7%. And we've got 10.9% for those workers who are 21 to 22 years old. This is the biggest increase in the national living wage ever. It's very significant. It amounts to a total of 1,600 pounds per annum for somebody aged 23 or more who is working full-time and paid national minimum wage. Now, obviously that's a huge boost to lower paid workers. It's gonna go a long way towards helping them to manage in this cost of living crisis. So 1,600 pounds for the worker, that's also 1,600 pounds plus cost 
um, given the other costs of employing people um, for the engager. And it's really important that employers manage those costs. So there are some relatively easy things that they need to do. National minimum wage and the rules and regulations are complicated and they do not necessarily tie in with tax rules, for example. So when you're setting your pay rates and when you're looking at your policies and procedures, make sure you understand the impact from the national minimum wage, national living wage perspective. Do you have adequate control measures for recording and monitoring national minimum wage? Now, I've been helping a client um, recently who had all the correct policies and procedures, but they weren't being implemented properly. So in retail outlets around the country, they weren't recording breaks, breaks correctly, which meant that employees potentially were working for six minutes a day unpaid, which doesn't sound very much, but when you add it up, and if you have um, a whistleblower amongst your employees, which is strongly encouraged by HMRC, you could find a significant cost together with significant penalties. The other things to think about are whether you're taking any deductions other than the normal statutory deductions and to make sure that you are comfortable that you are calculating um, pay correctly and understand the differences between salaried workers and the rules there changed relatively recently and hourly paid workers. If you've got any questions, do ask, it's complicated. It's really easy to get it wrong. Next slide, thank you. Would you like some good news? So the good news is that the take up of electric vehicles as company cars and generally has been huge for a number of reasons, both environmental and cost based. We're going to see um, vehicle excise duty introduced on company cars. And obviously that's not an employment tax point, but I think it's worth, worth mentioning. And if you want to have some fun, have a look at the arguments on social media about whether excise duty should or could be applied to an electric vehicle. They're quite entertaining. But from a uh, um, an employment tax, a corporate benefit perspective, um, we are looking at some changes which the government have, have said are to help companies to plan because the changes are set out to 2028, but also to incentivize the take up of electric vehicles, which is part of our COP26 commitments. Um, an electric vehicle is currently taxed as a benefit in kind if it's made available for private use by an employer to an employee, and the cash equivalent is currently 2% of the list price, and that is going to stay the same until April 2025. From that point in time, the benefit in kind goes up by 1%, so it becomes 3% in 25, 26, and another 1% in each of 26, 27, and 27, 28. And that takes us up to a maximum, what they call appropriate percentage of 5% for electric cars and 21% for ultra low emission cars. Now, what that means is they're still significantly cheaper than a traditionally fueled vehicle. All other vehicle bans go up by 1% in 25, 26 and keep going until they get to a, a maximum appropriate percentage of 37%. Um, and then that is fixed in 26, 27, 27, 28. So if you're looking at um, cost effective benefits for your employees and um, you are running a company car fleet, thinking of introducing a company car fleet or your employees are at a point where their leases need exchanging, Look at whether a salary exchange, so giving up taxed salary for a low tax benefit is effective, that falls outside of what we call the Oprah rules and provides something that is a very attractive proposition for the employer and employee alike in cost terms, and it goes towards your ESG agenda. Next slide, please. It's worth mentioning, again, Liam, Liam touched on it, the first year allowance for electric vehicle charging points has been extended to 31st of March 2025, both for corporation tax purposes and for income tax purposes. So if you're providing an electric vehicle, um, it can also be very cost effective to put in a charging point at the employee's home so they can charge it up. Um, that's been introduced to continue to incentivize to incentivize business investment in the charging infrastructure. And it seems to make sense given the increasing popularity of electric vehicles. And then if you do provide vans as benefits, the van benefit charge, as well as fuel benefit charges will increase in line with CPI. So they will continue to increase. So the message overall is there is some good news if you have a company car fleet, but otherwise employers are facing increases in the cost of employing um, their workforce. So make sure you spend 
um, your employee spend, your employee budget on things they really value. Make sure the benefits you provide are those that the employees want and make sure that your compliance is really up to scratch so that you're not wasting money paying it out in penalties and interest. And on that note, I will hand you over to Glyn Woodhouse, who's going to talk to you about indirect taxes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Caroline. Super. Um, so, <laughs> unfortunately, not very much happened in the budget on, on, on VAT. Um, probably not a massive surprise, uh, given that most VAT changes uh, tend to be inflationary and inflation is the enemy. So that was never going to really happen. However, it doesn't mean that we don't have anything to say. So let's have a quick chat about the VAT registration threshold. One of the things that was announced that the registration thresholds, and this is the threshold below which uh, a business does not need to register for VAT, has been frozen until um, March 2026. Now, the interesting thing here is that those registration thresholds have been that, that way since 2017. Uh, that would mean that they've had more than nine years at the same rate, which is um, highly unusual and highly strange. Um, and in any case, the, the, the rates in the UK are, are more than twice as high as the EU um, and OECD average. Um, and indeed, actually, if you, if, if you look at them, um, the Office for Tax Simplification criticised those rates quite heavily in their report. Um, suggesting that it creates a cliff edge for business and, and is, um, is getting in the way of growth. Um, so a little bit of a surprise, that one, um, but quite a nuanced one. There was an announcement yesterday about import tariffs, um, where over a, 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 a big range of tariffs have been suspended for a period of two years. Um, once again, um, this is a bit of a surprise to see this as part of the budget, uh, part of the autumn statement, sorry, um, but it's not massive surprise overall because these are the um these are the the benefit suspensions that business applied for um last year so last year the businesses were were, were, were invited to submit things that would uh, tariffs that were getting in the way of their business and and the government promised to uh apply those so out of 200 i think they did did 100 of them um We'll see what happens. That process is ongoing. So if there are um, duty tariffs which are getting in the way of your business, then um, I think the next applicant, the, the next point where you can apply to have tariffs suspended is in 2023. Um, not seeing the details of how that's gonna, how that's actually going to operate in 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 reality yet, but keep an eye on that if that's if that's of interest to you. Um, from an economic benefit point of view, I guess we should probably sit back a moment and just think, well. Hopefully, the benefit from those tariff suspensions will will apply to the importing businesses in the UK, rather than just giving an excuse for overseas business to raise their costs um, to uh, because the, the tariff is no longer there. Let's see what happens on that. Um, hopefully, that'll be a, a decent outcome. Um, as Caroline mentioned, the vehicle excise duty on electric vehicles um, from April 2025. So I, I won't I won't belabor that. Um, it was just one of those announcements. An announcement that wasn't part of the autumn statement, but was released on exactly the same day and therefore um, should be viewed with some suspicion, um, was the revenues announcement of the new estimated VAT gap. Now, the VAT gap is the gap between the theoretical um, VAT uh, take or the, the theoretical amount of VAT that should be paid um, against the VAT that was actually paid. And that's gone up by over a billion pounds and it's now sitting at 10, 10 billion pounds or nearly 7% of the overall uh, VAT take. That, 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 is, that, that is a massive number. Um, to be fair to the revenue, they have noted that with the changes in, the, the, the changes in VAT rates um, through the pandemic times for, for specific businesses, it's, it's probably not as accurate as it normally is. Um, but I think, for me, that probably means that the Treasury is going to lean on the revenue um, and get them to be a bit harder nosed in, in value added tax. Um, probably, probably keep an eye out for that over the next year or so, uh, because I suspect that that will that that will that will have an impact somewhere. Um, so if we move on to the next slide, um, and we'll have a very very brief uh, run through the new penalty regime in, in, in VAT. Now this was announced uh, 
a little while ago as a refresh to the default surcharge regime. And this is the penalties you get when you don't either put your VAT return in on time or you don't pay your VAT return on time. Um, now, I can I can almost hear the wailing of those currently studying for their for their for their tax exams um, because this was always a this was always a, a great mainstay of our of our student population. Um, but the default surcharge regime will end at the end of this uh, calendar year, um, and there'll be a new regime with two different penalties uh, applying. The first one is a is a penalty on a filing a filing penalty. Um, and it's based on a point system. So every time you put in a VAT return late, you will get given a point. Um, and depending on the frequency of your VAT returns as to when those points don't mean prizes, they mean penalties. Um, so annual VAT returns, obviously, once you get two points, because obviously you only do one a year, so second year you'll, you'll, you'll get a filing penalty. Quarterly returns, four points, um, will get you a penalty and monthly returns, five points. Uh, probably pretty fair if you think about it in, in, in those terms. Um, the key point here, though, that I want to highlight is that the points don't expire when you get a penalty. Um, so unlike default surcharge, um, you are capable of getting multiple penalties once you're in that regime. So once you're on, once you're on your uh, four points or two points or whatever it is, um, then you are going to get penalties quite regularly until you've managed to get your good behaviour through for a period of two years, which is longer than the previous default surcharge regime. So if we flick on to the next slide, we'll talk about penalties for late payments. Uh, slightly more complicated um, because if you are up to 15 days late um, and you either pay within that 15 days or you agree a payment plan with the revenue within that 15 days, you're not going to trigger a penalty at all. Um, that's very welcome for, for, for businesses, particularly businesses that are struggling a little bit. Um, if you pay between 16 and 30 days late, you're going to get uh, what's known as a, a first penalty or a 2% penalty um, of the amount that's outstanding on day 15. So if you pay some of it, you'll get a, a lower penalty rate. And that, once again, um, needs to be borne in mind by businesses which are, which, which are in distress. Um, if you go over the 30 days, um, you're going to get the 2% penalty penalty or day 15. And you're also going to get another 2% penalty for the amount at day 30, and a daily penalty calculated uh, at a 4% per annum rate on the amount outstanding. So the longer you leave it outstanding, the bigger your penalty will get. Um, so rather than just the, the cliff edge penalty system that you have at the moment, you're going to have uh, a much more nuanced system. Probably pretty welcome over the ball. I think it seems a, a relatively fair or certainly fairer than the default surcharge could be. Um, but let's, let's see how that, that pans out. Um, the government have also introduced a period of familiarisation, um, and this is going to basically mean that they're not going to pay the first penalty, that's in the, the, the 16 to 13 day penalty, um, if, if you pay it within the 30 days. So providing you clear it down, you're not going to get a penalty for, for, for paying it a little bit late there. Um, and that's going to go for the entire calendar year of 2023 um, when they're going to ramp it up again. Somewhat surprisingly generous, but uh, but but very welcome all the same. So that's all I've got to say on indirect taxes. Unfortunately, it's not going to be very exciting for anybody. So I shall hand over to Ben and let's talk about personal tax. Thank you very much, Glenn. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, still struggling with, um, despite best part of two years of lockdown, struggling to put my camera on and off. So hopefully I'm all with you now and you can hear me loud and clear. Um, so if we move on to the next slide, please, I'm just going to take you through the um, changes announced or not announced on income taxes and capital gains tax, et cetera. So this slide here will show us the, you know, I suppose, the big change coming out of yesterday, wasn't it? it was the, which was largely trailed anyway, so confidently so we drafted these slides on Wednesday. So um, only slightly annoyed. It was 125,140 rather than 125,000 dead, which we'd originally put in. But the rate at which the high rate kicks in is now at that £125,000 band. So what that means is that, you know, well, everybody owning, earning £125,000 is about £1,250 more in tax a year. Um, the other change there is the well, non-change, should we say, is the personal allowance freeze. Um, and as, um, as slightly predicted, um, they've extended that freeze to the 2027-28 tax year. 
So what this means is to say, those earning £125,000 or more will pay a little bit more tax. Um, those where we earn a bit more in the future, um, by stealth, if you can call it that, we will sort of pay a, a higher proportion of our uh, income subject to taxes. And we'll go on to um, give some examples of that. Next slide, please. So what we've done um, coming up on the next slide, we've tried to illustrate the impact of these freezing allowances. Um, it's it's a, um, a slight art rather than exact science, of course. But what we've done is look at, if we look at um, freezing allowances, assume all the allowances freeze as, as announced in, uh, up until 2028, and we'll compare that to say, what if, if we were to get a 3% pay rise each year, um, and um, compare that to if our annual rate bands were kind of inst extended in line with um, uh, the CPI over those years as well. And we've done three examples just to illustrate the position of a £30,000 taxpayer, a £60,000 taxpayer, and a £120,000 taxpayer. So if we move on to the next slide, please. Um, so is there, is there one slide before that? Here we go. So this is the um, this is the sort of effective rate um, of, of tax that we would pay as a result of those changes. There, as we're saying, so that first column CPI at prior September. So this is you know currently looking at inflation of ten percent. We've kind of estimated six percent for the following year. I know the sort of government are saying around seven percent, but if we were to assume that um, our allowances were to rise in line with those um, index amounts. It is quite rare, but for illustration purposes, we'll go through that. And the next one, wage growth, if we were to assume our salaries would go up by sort of 3% um, per annum as well, we can show that um, on the £30,000 salary, um, looking at if everything were indexed by 27, 28, um, you know, total taxes would be 17 and a bit percent of our income, whereas actually it's 20% as a result of things being frozen. Um, at the other end, £120,000 and above. If everything was indexed, our total tax contribution would be 35%, 35.4% of our income, whereas as things are frozen, it could go up to 42.3%. So therefore, with the trails or the, you know, the headlines, everybody's going to pay more tax. You know, maybe people were thinking, is that sort of tax rises per se? I would say it's not tax rises per se, other than reduction in the allowance, but the freeze in the allowance does, um, does um, catch up eventually. So uh, I suppose here as well, the, uh, I just wanted to mention, we haven't illustrated it here, but it's still that tipping point of salaries between 100 to 125,000, um, which, um, which bear the biggest burden in terms of effective rate. So if you, someone earning 100,000 pounds a year, I think the total tax they would pay on that is 27,000 pounds. For someone earning 125,000, the total tax they pay on that is 42,000. So in effect, you're paying £15,000 on that £25,000 pay rise, which is you know, a 60% effective tax rate. So I think there's, you know, there's certainly been calls in the past for simplification of IHT and CGT, but uh, I think there's got to be a call for simplification of income tax and, and national insurance duties too. Um, next slide, please. So this is just to um, put it into some real numbers. When I was looking at this slide, it's um, I was going to say those. Well, I'm a fan of bullseye, which shows my age, but this is perhaps let's have a look at what you could have won. So if we were to again run with those numbers to say, well, if if um, if my wage went up by three percent each year, um, and if my uh, tax free allowances had risen in allowance in risen in the line with um, uh, inflation, um, I would have um, you know for that column C to point to an example. So I would have been better off by the best part of a thousand pounds next year. I would have been better off by the best part of 5,000 pounds the following year and so on. So it, it sort of mounts up there to say, well, over that time, um, I, I could have, I could have been 35,000 pounds better off than I would have been again, assuming um, pay rises had gone 3% uh, per annum and um, things had lined in with inflation. So not exact science. I know we do have a, um, it's been announced that these have been frozen until 2028. I guess time will tell whether that actually falls out. There is a general election, of course, um, probably sometime the back end of next year. Um, so we'll see where we are then. But I think it does illustrate the point of um, tax by stealth, the freeze in the allowances, how we just, um, uh, you know, perhaps a chance we just hope, like to say there, 
we won't miss um, what we don't have, um, but it does catch up with us. Next slide, please. Um, this is so, so my, uh, uh, I primarily focus on owner managed businesses, privately owned businesses. So the effective tax rate calculation is, is always um, quite interesting and uh, one that gets a, a lot of questions. Do I take by salary or do I take by dividend? So what this effective rate tax calculation, I'm sure many of the audience here would be familiar with what we're looking at, but we're saying if you take a salary, there's employers and insurance, you've got PAYE and employee national insurance, but you take a corporation tax deduction for that. If you pay a dividend, um, you pay the dividend tax, but there's no corporation tax deduction. So looking at everything in the round, if my company makes £100 profits and I want to draw it, what's the most effective way to do that? And historically, the dividend has been the better answer. Uh, well, a slightly better answer, but you'll see from 2023, 24, with that corporation tax rate going up at 25%, um, it's now swinging in the favour of salary and bonus very slightly as opposed to dividend. Um, I guess the other sign of that is if you were to take a, a, a bonus as opposed to a dividend, uh, HMRC might be slightly more grateful because your tax would go through payroll rather than waiting for some tax to be collected through self-assessment through the dividend route. Um, but I say, often a question that's asked, but you can see it's it's starting to tip from uh, dividend to bonus as we move move into next year. Next slide, please. So I think sometimes no news is good news, and I think that's the case here. I certainly had personally a lot of questions in the run up to the autumn statement around uh, speculation around CGT changes. I guess it's always inevitable that there would be. Um, my advice was I don't foresee any, and um, if they were, I couldn't imagine it happening from from uh, from yesterday. Um, always a little bit on tenter hooks until the final announcement does come through, as it did yesterday. But um, that obviously bared out to be true. So CGT rates as they were. So the the, the only change really was to the reduction of the um, annual exempt amounts. So what we've got is currently we've got twelve thousand three hundred. That is just over half to 6,000 next year and then 3,000 the year after that. I think the, the costings HMRC estimate that's going to raise about £1.6 billion pounds between now and the end of 2028. Um, but as, as with all their costings, it's really best estimates and it does, of course, depend on the tax base um, and, and behaviours. So whether people are just um, uh, uh, you know, realising gains to realise their nil rate bans um, it may, may or may not come to fruition um, and so on, but it, it's certainly probably not a significant change that's going to drive any um, uh, uh, or, or, or accelerate any business sales, I would imagine, or property sales, given the relatively modest changes when you're looking at things of that in the market. Um, no changes to business asset disposal relief. Say this is the one that, that um, the first one million pounds of a sale in your in your personal trading company when you own five percent on um, qualifies for tax at ten percent as a reduction uh, compared to the headline rate of twenty percent. Um, IHT again, no changes. Nil rate threshold still three hundred twenty five thousand. That's been there uh, for quite a while, and the additional one hundred seventy five thousand to top it up to five hundred thousand to to cover for the main home. Main rate of IHT is still 40%, um, but all the other um, IHT exemptions reliefs remain. So the likes of business relief, the ability to transfer things and survive seven years, um, pets and so on um, are still available. Next one. Again, no change. Um, no change to ISA limits. Um, so we're still I think four types of ISA, I believe, and a junior ISA as well. So we can still put a combined 20,000 in amongst our four grown up houses and ISAs and 9,000 into junior ones. Um, I'll sort of set limits between some of them, but 20,000 in total. Um, state pension, triple lock uh, to be maintained um, for this parliament. Um, the lifetime allowance that was already frozen uh, at the current limits of uh, 1,073,000 up until 25, 26. I didn't see an extension of that um, yesterday, maybe, but um, that's where we are. That's the only point to make is, again, as with those um, fiscal drags on our, you know, the percentage of our um, the income subject to tax in the future as a rate of rate freezes, it could mean that that lifetime allowance charge, i.e. that tax charge that comes out if you draw 
uh, money out of your pension once that lifetime allowance exceeded um, could see more people falling into that sort of 25 or 55 percent tax fine uh, tax rate as a result of doing that um, next slide so that's now as important as ever ways to manage a tax bill um, ISAs which we've mentioned um, pension contributions are still the limit forty thousand pounds there a year, which can be an efficient way of um, uh, providing for the future. Um, again, especially if you're near the threshold of the, of the hundred thousand, um, where you do start losing your nil rate band, and the hundred twenty five thousand now, where you um, tip into the forty five percent tax rate rather than forty percent. Electric car, and Caroline's mentioned that. I know as a as a as a petrol head myself, who's very recently been converted to electric cars. Um, if nothing else, go drive one and see what you think. Um, but also um, when you do the numbers, um, they are quite compelling um, looking at company cars and electric cars. Um, and when capital gains tax and inheritance tax, let's say all the, um, uh, all the exemptions and reliefs and sensible planning um, still come into play, uh, more sensible to consider uh, than ever. And um, we can happily have a discussion and advise you on those. Next slide, please. A quick word on uh, HMRC powers and enforcement. Um, you know, those of us sort of provide professional services, it's one thing to agree the fee and do the work, but then of course you need to collect the money. Um, as for HMRC, um, similarly um, uh, need to collect the taxes. So at 30 September 22, the total tax debt. So this is agreed. Um, tax, which is uh, agreed as due and payable, um, was 40, that's part of 47 billion pounds. And that's up from 19 billion since March 20. So you can see that's a huge increase. Um, you know, of course, there are reasons for that. Um, and the pandemic being noted, there are um, very possibly some um, difficult um, uh, stories in there um, with, with people's ability to pay. Um, but certainly there's going to be focus from HMRC to um, collect those outstanding debts. And um, there was a consultation recently on modernization of debt collection and that closed earlier this year. So we'll wait to see uh, what things came from there, perhaps more targeted at um, those companies which are a bit more uh, naughty offenders, um, perhaps with um, uh, directors, some suggestions raised around uh, personal guarantees or funds on deposit and so on. Um, so we'll see what see what comes out of that. Um, disguise remuneration loan charge. So lots of discovery assessments have recently been issued for um, the 18-19 tax year, uh, where taxpayers are, um, HMRC believe taxpayers have taken remuneration in the form of loans as opposed to salaries. And now um, after those, um, uh, the income tax on those. Property issues, still very high on HMRC's enforcement agenda. Um, Nudge letters is the way of, of, of HMRC trying to uh, uh, prod good behaviour. Um, I think there's about 10 or so nudge letters, I think, at, at last count that I've seen until recently. Um, another one recently issued to um, landlords who HMRC don't think have been um, disclosing their uh, rental income. So what they've managed to do is see those that have placed money through the deposit, uh, the, the, the rental deposit scheme and um, have notified them to make sure they um, uh, record their income on their tax returns. And for those um, non-resident property owners, uh, offshore companies must register at company's house by 31 January 2023 to disclose the beneficial owners companies. So I think property has uh, a lot of changes over the last few years. Um, you'll see the capital gains rate is 28% for sale of property rather than 20%. All residential properties subject to IHT or wherever it's held we have ATED rules, um, there's additional um, SDLT rules, um, and, and now we've got these uh, the register of offshore companies and say nudge, nudge letters as well. And the other one I just wanted to mention for completeness is um, what's coming our way um, is, the, is the OECD digital platform transparency. So this is, so those familiar with the common reporting standard where financial institutions around the world are sharing information with local tax authorities about accounts held and money's held. Um, this is a uh, where sort of digital uh, platform providers need to provide details to HMRC of uh, businesses and individuals offering accommodation, transport and personal services through their web. So data collected from January 24 
and first reports need to be made by those in, those businesses to HMRC from January 2025. So presumably in the first instance, that's going to lead to some more nudge letters um, to make sure people have appropriately disclosed um, uh, their, their relevant income. So I think that's where uh, I got to on personal taxes and a bit of powers and enforcement. Um, I say probably many people have heard the headline straight after budget overnight and so on. Um, additional rate of, uh, I say, tax flow is only 125,000. The personal allowance is freezing, sort of catch up as in due course. But if no news is good news, then there are no changes to um, the main no changes to CGT headline rates, business asset disposal relief or changes to IHT, I'm sure is, is welcome. Thank you. I'll um, switch off from there. Thank you, Ben. Re really informative. Thank you very much. We're we're just about hitting eleven o'clock, which which was the scheduled end. But we've got a, a number of questions. So what we're going to try to do is uh, just deal with a couple of those questions. Uh, if we don't get round to yours, we will follow up and contact you uh, directly with it with an answer. Uh, but if you've got another meeting, obviously feel free to to drop off drop off now. Um, First question has come through a, a, a couple of times is, I think Caroline, it's probably one for you and around IR35 and uh, the, the, any news on that in and around the statement. And I think there's a there's a suggestion that you know, freelancers are vital to the economy and sort of what, what does that all mean? Where, where have we landed on that? We've been doing an IR35 hokey cokey over the last couple of months, um, but where we're at at the moment is um, quite unsurprising because um, when Kwasi Kwarteng repealed the IR35 reforms um, in his budget, um, the predicted cost of that was going to be £6 billion over the next five years. So that was promptly reversed by Jeremy Hunt and nothing has now changed. So we are where we were before the removal of the IR35 reforms. If you engage um, a worker and the nature of the relationship is more of employment than self-employment, and you can check that using free tools available on HMRC's website called Check Employment Status for Tax, then you as the engager, the end client, are responsible for assessing the employment status and the person paying the worker, or if there's a personal services company, that company is responsible for deducting PAYE national insurance. That's it in a nutshell. It's really complicated. If anybody needs any help on specific place, cases, please do give us a call. Thank, thanks, Caroline. Um, and Ben, there are a couple of questions around a theme around sort of the, the various changes to the personal tax rates and band, bans around what that will actually mean in practice. Uh, there's a question uh, around what about the people uh, that are in between that sort of 100k to 125k position in terms of sort of that, that sort of a punitive rate and that calculation there? Is, is anything changed there? There's also a question around um yeah does it make sense for people dropping down to a four day week if they're at the the 50 to 60k mark uh and and similarly sort of a question around um salaries versus dividends for for companies that are at the small rate does does the uh does the dividend still make sense sorry to th three there ben do, do you do you want to pick those off Three, three questions. I'll take, I'll take a reverse order. So yes, the question around um, the OMBs, and I think for the, uh, the, the smaller OMBs, if we can say that, those that pay 19%, and, and yes, um, the calculations did flick up on screen there, but it's still at that, for those companies that remain paying corporation tax at 19%, um, it's still a bit more efficient to pay a dividend rather than uh, a bonus or salary. Um, it's when you get to um, uh, large companies paying 25% and high rate taxpayers that the bonus and starts to slightly slightly better. Um, I, I think the um, the, the hundreds, 125,000 one, that was certainly illustrated that. And it's quite um, uh, that, that 100,000 limit where it kicks in has been there since 2017. So in itself has been a kind of stealth tax because arguably 100,000 pounds a day is not quite what it was worth um, five years ago. Um, so I think that you know, there needs to be some simplification for, 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 for personal tax. And our own David Ellis, I think, uh, made some very good comments yesterday, shared through LinkedIn about, well, I think it leads into the second question as well. It just feels wrong that if you're going to get a pay rise, um, 
you, you start to question whether it's really worth it because of punitive additional tax that you're going to pay that compared to otherwise. So, uh, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I guess I'm not qualified to advise on what people will necessarily do as a result of those of those bans. You know, ultimately, we need to earn and pay, and they just have to accept it for now. But I guess, you know, we'll see. You know, I suppose it leads into these, you know, the costings as well. It depends on tax base and it depends on um, uh, uh, behavior in terms of how much additional taxes they actually raise from these. And I guess that will pan out over the next year or two to see whether they are achieving additional tax take or behaviors are indeed changing. So, so not so necessarily so. Brilliant. That, that, that's that's great, Ben. We're, we're five minutes over, so so we'll wrap it up there. There are a number of questions we haven't got to, but we will contact you directly with with answers on those. So, uh, like to say a, a big thanks to all the speakers, but also a thanks to you for for joining. Uh, the 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 kind of recording of the presentation will be circulated around. It'll be available on the website. So if you want to go back and uh, reference that, uh, the link that is there on the screen, or just sort of access via the the BDO uh, website, or feel free to sort of contact your usual uh, contact to follow up on any other points. Um, thank you once again for joining, uh, and thanks again. Bye.